Right about now is the most lovely season in Shanghai. Right about now is when people are most active outdoors. Strolling down the banks of the Huangpu River, flying kites in the open fields, or trying to nab a match in the infamous marriage market at People's Park. But a year ago, Shanghai was a completely different place. Everyone to stay at home. Vehicles are not allowed in or out. March 28, 2022, was the start of the Shanghai lockdown. For more than 60 days, 20 million residents weren't allowed to set foot outside of their apartments. In China's wealthiest city, food became scarce, medicine was hard to come by, and survival became a daily struggle. There were only two things on my mind, to find food, and to not go crazy. In today's Shanghai, it's almost hard to believe that it all happened. But in some small ways, everyone in the city still carries this scar. Now, when I make long-term plans, a voice in my head whispers to me, what if the lockdown happens again? My name is Wei Du, and I'm a foreign correspondent with CNA. I was born and grew up in a Chinese city of Chongqing. I used to work as a financial reporter, a job that had taken me to New York, Singapore, and briefly, Shanghai. Now, I'm based in Hong Kong, the business gateway to China. To be honest, the mainland China of the past three years bears little resemblance to the country I knew. That is why I wanted to do this podcast, to understand and remember what the people went through and how the last three years might have fundamentally changed China as we know it. This is Red Wall, Inside China's Zero COVID World, a two-part podcast where I trace the steps of people whose lives were dramatically altered by China's Zero COVID policy and who were still grappling with the sudden end of it all. Many of them have shared their stories on social media and that's where I found them. I've also verified the accounts that you will hear in this podcast. This includes checking their timestamps and geotags on the photos and videos they shared with us. Episode 1. And just like that, the rain stopped. There was a point last summer when it seemed China would never return to its pre-pandemic days. As the rest of the world had left the pandemic behind months earlier, 300 million Chinese people, 20% of the total population, were living under some form of a lockdown. In cities that not locked down, people's lives were dominated by weekly, sometimes daily, COVID tests. That's because the Chinese government was still trying to eradicate the virus. But just as no one could have predicted China's adoption of zero COVID, no one saw the end before it came. In late November, thousands of Chinese citizens across more than 20 cities took to the streets. <laughs> We want freedom, not COVID tests, they chanted. We want dignity, not lies. It was the largest protest in China in more than 30 years, and it worked. In just a few days, lockdowns ended. COVID testing booths torn down. And just like that, the end came. But the people were confused. Long lines formed outside the very few remaining testing booths. Older residents bolted the metal gates that had locked them into their homes. Suddenly, everyone was catching COVID and the authorities were unprepared. Painkillers were rationed. 
Emergency rooms filled up. Crematorians had to give out queue numbers as the bodies kept piling up. Officially, China recorded less than 100,000 COVID deaths, but estimates from scientists came in far higher than that. A team of epidemiologists at the University of Hong Kong estimated that by the end of January, just eight weeks after the policy U-turn, COVID had already killed 970,000 people in China. To get a sense of how bad things looked on the ground, we spoke to a doctor in Shanghai in early February. He's not allowed to speak to the media. That's why we will call him Hammer, which is his online moniker. Hammer works at a major hospital with over 1,000 beds. By then, hospitals had gone through the worst. He talked about what he had to go through in January this year. For as long as I'd been working, this was the busiest I'd been. The number of patients turning up at the hospital was unprecedented. Even the corridors were filled with patients. The last time I'd seen something similar, I was still little. It must have been 20 years ago. In the past 20 years, hospitals were rarely so crowded. This was the first time in 20 years I'd seen people sleeping in corridors. I asked him if it was true that all departments of the hospital had been converted to treat COVID patients. That was what I was reading online. People were saying that patients are winning for COVID but were seen by orthopedic surgeons. When the respiratory department ran out of beds, and orthopedics still had plenty, it was only natural that they made them available to COVID patients. So when the patient came in, he would have been seen by a respiratory doctor, but his routine care would be provided by the orthopedic doctors and nurses, because respiratory doctors were too busy. I asked if he saw the body count increase during that period of time. It's actually a bit complicated. We saw far more deaths than usual in a short period of time, but I'm not sure whether that was because the death rate was high, or it was a matter of squeezing a whole winter's death into one week. Right now, I still can't tell. But the truth is, I feel things weren't as bad as we had thought it would be. I had thought we could have a situation similar to what happened in Europe and the U.S. in 2020 or 2021, that we would have so many severe cases we could run out of ICU beds and ventilators. I thought we would even run out of oxygen, like some poor countries did. In the end, that didn't happen. I want to thank the virus for letting us off easy. Three, two, one. Can you hear me? I first got in touch with Hammer in early December when China had just abandoned zero COVID because that had meant a major shift in his life. There will be no more nostrils to swab, which was what he did for months. I remember it was when Shanghai was just locked down on April 1st or 2nd. In my work chat group, the hospital was enlisting doctors and nurses for PCR sample collection. So, I became a Dabai. Before we go any further, it's worth pausing for a second to explain what is a Dabai. It was initially the Chinese name for the Disney character Baymax. For those who haven't seen the cartoon, Baymax is a white inflatable healthcare robot who is partial to nagging. When COVID first came, people in China started calling the COVID swabbers in hazmat suits Dabais. In the first two years when COVID raged around the world, residents in China lived in relative calm, so Dabais were universally respected. So much so, there was a genre of videos on Chinese social media of young children, clearly put up by their parents, dancing to a melodramatic tune before Dabais to thank them for keeping the country safe. And the truth is, before Omicron hit, China was very successful at cutting off transmission through community lockdowns and universal testing. So to become a Dabai wasn't a difficult decision at the time. There are more than 20 million residents in Shanghai. If they all needed to be swapped once, I was wondering how long would that take? So I thought, fine, I'll go. Let's get this over with.
I remember the first time I went, I had to get up really early in the morning. The call time was 4.30 a.m. By the time we finished, it was 7 or 8 p.m. The only break I had was lunch. The rest of the time, I would not get out of my hazmat suit. In the beginning of the lockdown, there was a shortage of personal protective equipment. So we would wear one suit for at least half a day. You really had to try not to drink water because every time after you had gone to the bathroom, you needed a new hazmat suit. Hammer and Siski would swap on more than 300 people a day, which to me was just an incredible number. Oh, no, no, that's not a lot. The nurses were much better at this kind of thing. They worked like robots on an assembly line. If it was a well-organized neighborhood and everyone was cooperative, they could swap 500 to 600 people a day. Hammer was hoping he will only have to be a Dabai once or twice because as a trained medical doctor, he knew it wasn't realistic to eradicate Omicron like China did with the past variants. I thought lockdown and test was a useful tool to gain knowledge of the virus, like transmissibility and virality. With this knowledge, we could make better decisions like targeted vaccination and expansion of ICUs. So I thought the sooner we finished one round of mass testing, the faster we could end the lockdown. I had no idea it would last three months. Because Dabais were exhausted and began treating people poorly, public opinion towards them was shifting. During the height of the lockdowns, some Dabais were filmed forcing their way into people's homes, trashing the place in the name of containing the virus. In one case, battering a pet dog to death, and in another, pinning a father to the ground in front of his children. The hazmat suit that was once seen as cute and clumsy now symbolized, at best, a painful routine people had to put up with, and at worst, pointless cruelty. Across the table, you and I were both just a number. There was no dignity to speak of. On your side of the table, people came and went. On my side of the table, work never ended. There was no time to think. After the first few hours, to be honest, I didn't even care if it was a human being I was swabbing. Soon, I completely lost faith in mass testing, so I would try not to go. Going into May, I was no longer sure collecting PCR samples was helping anyone at all. When he was not out swabbing people, Hammer was locked in at home just like everyone else. There were only two things on my mind, to find food and to not go crazy. The hospital he was working at was closed, which meant he couldn't treat his patients. I remember a very sad case. In March, we found a tumor in a patient. The tumor was malignant and had to be operated on. His surgery was scheduled for April the 2nd. The timing was unfortunate. The Shanghai lockdown started on March 28th. The patient missed his surgery window by just five days. When he came back for surgery three months later, the tumor had grown so big it couldn't be operated on. So he had to have chemotherapy to shrink it first. It was during chemo his tumor spread onto his skin and caused a huge area of lesion. If only he was allowed to have his surgery as planned, none of that would have happened. There must have been at least a few hundred patients in a similar situation during the lockdown. That cancer patient is still alive, but the same cannot be said of many others. Throughout the lockdowns of 2022, families who couldn't get their loved ones to the hospital would post on social media site Weibo seeking help. Many later updated to say the patients had died at home in an ambulance or steps away from the hospital gate. We reached out to more than 20 of the original posters. All of them declined to speak to us. Shanghai's citywide lockdown ended at the beginning of June, lasting a total of 63 days. Sporadic lockdowns of buildings and neighborhoods continued into November. 
But when the end came, it came just as much of a surprise. Some of my colleagues have been sent to other cities to collect PCR samples. By the time they arrived, they were told that there would be no more testing. So they returned to Shanghai and were quarantined for five days because they had left the city. But what for? Everyone in the city was catching COVID anyway. When we first spoke in December, Hammer hadn't been back to the hospital since the policy U-turn. He too got COVID and was down with a fever. He said he was planning to quit medicine and find a normal 9 to 5 office job. Working as a doctor in China is taxing even in normal times, and zero COVID had crushed his spirit. After being locked up for three months, I can no longer be certain about many things in life. Throughout his months of poking into people's nostrils, Hammer knew it was a fruitless exercise. That's one thing you might find a little hard to understand, that so many people knew they were doing something completely irrational, yet no one wanted to say anything. But that just made the protests that eventually brought about the end all that much more surprising. Our next interviewee had an even more dramatic case of just going with the flow. We will call her Kaka, that's also her online alias. Kaka worked as a lockdown enforcer in the neighborhood of Guangzhou. She was given an armband to wear. She didn't even qualify for the hazmat suit. But just that little armband, it gave her magical power that till this day she struggles to understand. As long as I wore the armband, no one stopped me from doing anything. For about a month, I didn't do PCR tests, but I went anywhere I wanted. Kaka's journey to becoming a lockdown enforcer was a bit unusual, because till mid-November, she still had a much coveted job in China's once booming technology sector. I got a phone call from my team leader, telling me I was laid off. I was working from home that day, because Guangzhou was having an outbreak, and my place was locked down. So, Job cuts were quite common since 2021. You see it on social media all the time. As far as I know, all the tech firms in China had to cut jobs. It was Kaka's first job. So even though she saw it coming, she still took it hard. It was a Wednesday when I received the call. Then I started drinking. For the next three days, I would drink, throw up, fall asleep, get up and drink some more. On day four, I saw on WeChat that the village was hiring temporary security guards for about 150 yuan a day. I thought it would be an easy job, so I signed up. Kaka lives in an urban village in Guangzhou. In the early parts of China's urbanization, cities often outgrew their boundaries into rural areas. Sometimes urban planning couldn't catch up, so the villagers held on to the land and their low-rise homes, even when the surrounding areas are full of shiny skyscrapers. These urban villages aren't terribly pleasant places to live, but rents are low, so young people and migrant workers tend to cluster there. And unlike other parts of the city, they're still run by the village committees. Their members are often families who had lived there for hundreds of years. <laughs> There were 68 guards. Some were villagers who came because the village committee told them to. I think they truly believed they were protecting their homeland. The others were temporary workers, like me. Some of them were migrant workers. They had jobs in garment factories, electronics factories, or restaurants. But because of the lockdown, they couldn't get out. So becoming a security guard was a way to make up for the lost income. At this point, there was actually no COVID cases inside the village, but there was a cluster nearby. The committee was hoping that its measures would prevent the virus from entering the village. Although, in reality, it worked out very differently. In practice, we would let people come in, but we wouldn't let them go out. It didn't make sense. 
All I could tell the villagers was, I don't know why. You should ask the village committee. It also wasn't entirely true that no one got out. In the videos Kaka took on a job, delivery riders came and went. In terms of pandemic control, I thought the lockdown was completely useless. There was no way that could have stopped the virus. By then, the entire country was tired of COVID controls, and people no longer hit their disdain for the enforcers. In Kaka's other videos, angry villagers who needed to go to work or wanted to see their families on the other side would come up to the checkpoint and argue with the guards. If you really wanted to go out, it helped to look really angry. To be honest, we always let the angry ones out. Keeping a really angry person inside was dangerous. She could have incited others to charge the checkpoint. And the four men couldn't allow that to happen. You know who couldn't get out? The nice ones. Like this old lady who left an impression on Kaka. She pleaded with every one of us at the checkpoint. She said she had a grandson with disability alone at home. And if she didn't get out, her grandson would starve. She was too nice. She didn't dish out threats. It was very sad. I completely understand that the job was unethical. I was abetting evil behaviour. Kaka would try to avoid her confrontation, but her co-workers, two young migrant workers, would often get into heated verbal arguments and sometimes even physical fights. They felt that rules were rules, and if you disobeyed the rules, you also hurt their pride. Wearing the armband was able to transform them. Suddenly, they became someone with power, however small that power is. By then, Kaka felt she had seen enough. She wanted to quit and find a proper job. But the end came even sooner than she was prepared for. On November 30th, 10 days after she became a lockdown enforcer, Guangzhou became the first major Chinese city to do away with all COVID controls. On the night of the 30th, we were told in the group chat not as many people would be needed the next day. Soon after, the group chat closed down. For the second time in just two weeks, she was again out of a job. It felt a bit ridiculous that I couldn't even keep a job enforcing COVID rules. Kaka says she's given up on planning a career and will just do whatever jobs that come her way because she feels there's so little she can actually control. And that seems to be consistent with how our interviewees all think. For the first time in their adult lives, the future is not as clear anymore. And it's not just frustrating, but soul-crushing. The last three years in living under China's zero-COVID policy has changed their outlook on life and made them rethink ambitions. Because who knows when their lives will be appended again? In the next episode of Red Wall, Inside China's Zero-COVID World, I speak to two people who suddenly found that the longest journey in the world was the road back home. This podcast is written and produced by me, Wei Du. My co-producer is Anderson Shah. Editing by Tiffany On and Crispina Robert. And sound design by Sai Ye Wen. Thanks for listening.